Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by two special guests, Dr. Brian Dietrich. Hello, Brian. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Excellent. And my other special guest is uh, Stephen Erickson. Hello, Steve. Hi, I think I think I need to find some, you know, really small, obscure uh, university to give me a, a doctorate. So you know, we can we can just run it across the board here. <laughs> you know what? Maybe we should do what we should sign you up to one of those online university things where. Yeah, you know, I think so. Because yeah. then you could be you, we'll be the three doctors. But well you, well, you know, I mean, I could even just choose my pseudonym to be Dr. Stephen Erickson, couldn't I? How about how about just, just Brian or or Doofus? We can just say doofus. Yeah. That works. Well, okay. Brian and Steve are joining me today because we wanted to have a chat about Star Trek. And the thing is, I'm on record that I, I, I have not been a fan of Star Trek Discovery, nor really of Star Trek Picard, but I was uh, a fan of various other elements of earlier Star Treks. Uh, Steve, you were a huge fan of Star Trek the original, weren't you? Yeah. That's what um, I grew up with, yeah. And let, would it be fair to say less so of the later iterations? Yes. <laughs> and Brian, you were a big fan of the original series as well. I, I know the original series like I know my own soul. Um, <laughs> I, I know they, they, they say 79, it's, if you count the cage, it, it's actually 80 episodes. I, I know them all. <laughs> I, I actually, my wife at one point when we were first dating, she called me up and said, I'm, I'm, I'm watching an episode of Star Trek. I hadn't seen this before. Let me quote a line. And she quoted and said, what's the episode? And I, I told her and she said, all right, I may have to not marry you. Um, <laughs> Nerd. Yeah, yeah. No, big big l yeah so the reason I, I i i i love that i i and i enjoy next gen um i i the original series formed me as a person next gen was was fun in a lot of ways deep space nine as as a as a scholar i and 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 a, and a writer, I, I actually truly enjoyed that as as art. Mm -hmm. And then the others kind of got away from me yeah. over I, time. I, I don't I don't know Discovery um, really at all. Um, but but I, I but I followed everything, and I know I know a little bit about Discovery, but not a lot. But I, I certainly know. If you want to talk about the original series, I'm there for you. <laughs> but, but the reason I thought we we talk about it is like um, my sort of Star Trek that I grew up with was um, Next Generation, and then obviously Deep Space Nine. But you know, I we've watched almost all of all of Star Trek, and we all have quite different perspectives on it. Because Brian, you you quite like Picard, whereas I didn't, and. Uh, Steve, I don't think you're as big a fan of Picard as, say, Brian is. No, I did not like Picard, no. Um, but uh, weirdly enough, I think we like and dislike different things for completely different reasons, because a lot of what I disliked about, say, uh, the early stuff in Discovery, and I will say now, for anyone watching who knows that I don't like Discovery, the last two episodes I watched, I really, really enjoyed. It was almost like they whoever was stopping the writers from doing the job of writing a good episode had been removed and let the writers actually have free reign to tell a good story because a lot of my criticisms of discovery were so minimized in those latest two episodes uh one was rubicon and i can't remember the name of the other one but they, they just were better episodes because and we'll get into this but Star Trek has fundamentally changed from early Star Trek to what it currently is. And I thought we could actually talk about what we saw in the different incarnations of Star Trek and what they were doing. 
Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think, um, uh, I don't know if Brian would agree with this, but there has been an evolution and it, it's, it's reflective of the world around it uh, at all times. I mean, the original Star Trek was certainly doing um, something uh, very subversive uh, and challenging. Um, just the, the visual presentation of uh, that was being that was part of Hollywood at that time. Um, and so it was very much a product of the 60s. And at the same time, it had this central assertion that when we get to the future, we are going to be better than what we are now. And I think this was slowly degraded uh, from all for all of the subsequent uh, narrations of Star Trek. Uh, it, it worked its way down to where by the time we got to Enterprise, for example, um, we were as uh, duplicitous and nasty and, and um, basically the same bastards we are now, but in the future with uh, you know more fancy technology. And not only that, it, uh, that series then took sort of the paragon of virtue, um, flawed, but still a paragon, uh, as personified by the, the Vulcans and completely uh, undermine that as well in the yeah. story modes. So we saw this, and one could argue that, oh, we became more realistic in, in the, you know, in the presentation of, of uh, human nature and all the rest. But I would argue realism was actually not the purpose of uh, the original series at all. It was to yeah. give us a place to reach, reach towards. Um, and, you know, with all the, with all the, um, you know the flaws uh, i mean no character in that series was perfect and so basically they were, they were all reaching towards an ideal and i think that has that that was lost very quickly um even within the next generation uh, although the next generation it, it it had some issues as well because it it seemed to have left behind um one of the central driving dramatic forces of uh, the original series, which was conflict among characters within the crew. Um, so this is why you had this, this, this triad of, of Kirk, Spock, and, and McCoy, in order to provide that conflict, the, the, the arguments that needed to be said, all the things that needed to be hashed out, and the choices that needed to be made. Um, there was a very, very strong push, I think from Roddenberry himself, um, in the next generation that there'd be no conflict among among the uh cast and, uh, uh, or rather the crew of the enterprise and i think that really sort of actually um, unplugged uh, a lot of a lot of potential for, for good storytelling but that's sort of a bit you know a whole different side of things i'm going to shut up now i mean the the, the great quote is a man's reach should exceed his grasp else what what's a heaven for yeah and and i think uh the original star trek star trek the original series is all about that you know reaching beyond and 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 trying to outstrip our baser natures although kirk of course very rarely lives up to that but the show does the the, the the imagining of a federation does the 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 vulcan ideology does there are any number of ways in which the original series tries to exceed humanity's grasp we'll strive toward something bigger than what we have what we had mm -hmm. at the time you know 60 Seven sixty-eight, sixty-nine, um, and I guess actually the the original the cage was sixty-five, but it wasn't uh, accepted, and then and then sixty-seven, sixty, sixty, sixty-seven that the actual series started um, with with the second pilot, um, but but that period at the end of the sixties. 
the show was deeply involved in the politics of the time, the, 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 the ideologies of the time, the, the desire to, 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 to reach beyond um, colonial borders, beyond uh, continental borders, beyond racial borders, beyond sexual borders, beyond gender borders, every, every possible border they, they, they wanted to, because they were hiring the, the great science fiction writers of the time who were already addressing these issues in short stories and novels and um, in, in pop culture. They were already doing this stuff. They hired them to come in, tell these stories and, and do something new. We have the first iteration of this and we have, you know, these episodes that deal with um, uh, let that be their last battlefield, which is about you know the the the, the two individuals, one who's half white and half black, and the other is half black and half white, and and they they their their battle throughout their lives has has destroyed their world, and and you've got uh, stories that uh, that that deal with uh, you know an anti anti matter universe and a matter universe that. You know, if these two these two Lazarus, if these two guys come together, they will destroy everything. And and then you've got um, um, a, a, a private little war, which is is all a metaphor for Vietnam. So it's it's on and on and on throughout the series. These these topics of the '60s, the things that that people were were worried about and scared about and wanted to think about, and they were only able to talk about them in a pop culture venue because it was science fiction it was safe right so so they they could do that if they actually had a show that dealt with those issues it wouldn't have gotten on the air you know in the same way that 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 mash got on the air because it was supposedly about korea not about vietnam but everybody knew it was about vietnam that, the same thing with 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 uh, Star Trek. It, it's 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 really dealing with important issues, and and they're 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 struggling to deal with these issues. And you've got a number of things that come up in in the shows that make you wonder about who we are and how we are and how we should be and that's what it's always been move into the next gen the immediacy of those issues perhaps in the mid to late 80s were not i i don't want to over generalize but i'm going to that they just weren't as extreme as they were in you know 1988 is not the same as 1968. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just not the same. And, and so, yes, Next Gen is still dealing with some of these issues, but not in the same way. Um, as you move into uh, the 90s with, with um, Deep, Space, Deep Nine. Space Nine, we get other issues being dealt with but but now the focus of the series is not so much about the difference and we were just all talking about this earlier the difference is not the issues but the presentation so it's no longer uh, episodic but serial and so the story becomes a larger grand a grand eloquent story um uh, which in many ways is a retelling of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, in fact, including, but not limited to an ending that takes place in a, in a volcano with people being thrown off precipices into the lava at the end. But anyway, so, so, so Deep Space Nine is, is, a, is a larger epic tale, which the other stories had not been. Then 
God help us all, we can't get Voyager. And I'll let other people talk about that because if I say anything, I'll I'll be, you know, reviled throughout history. Well, um, I, I have a slightly different perspective and, and take on this because one of the things that I see changing in Star Trek, and we, we can talk about individual episodes and the individual shows and what they were doing, but we went from an episodic morality play dealing with big issues using science fiction as a safe reframing of a core realistic ideological or political or socio-political issue and it was in a morality play and it was in an episodic format and the overwhelming ethos was one of optimism one of exploration and as, as Steve had said, you know, aspirational. This is who we could be trying to find resolutions to these problems that didn't involve just defeating the opponent. It was very much trying to find a way to grow beyond them. And it was aspirational. And then we moved into next generation. And there are still elements of that. But as next generation went on, a lot of the episodic elements started to fall away and we had the the double episodes where the mid-season finale would end on a cliffhanger and then the uh the short break and then when they came back it was the resolution of this and then that became like the big season finale and it started building towards these big battles and what i noticed in it was not only this movement away from a, an episodic which we still have we still have bottle episodes we still have the, the core tension of the episode of the week, but toward a, a larger narrative, the way that Brian described, but also a movement away from aspirational, optimistic exploration and toward the Federation or the good guys or whoever it is that we are following are the good guys and they have to fight an evil <laughs> in view. They have yeah. to fight an evil force. And the, all of these shows moved from exploration and optimism into where the universe was strange the universe was weird and yes it was dangerous because we didn't know but the more that we learned the more that we became part of that grand universal tapestry to the universe is frightening and strange it's full of things that are going to kill us so instead of arriving in a place to go oh i wonder what's here we arrived when shields up, let's shoot the hell out of these things, defeat them, and we'll make it safe for uh, the Federation to colonize. And that's what it suddenly became. It went from exploring the galaxy to find out what was there to arriving, shields up, uh, phasers and photon torpedoes. Let's have a big war with someone. And yes. that was a big transition I noticed. Uh, not and, only- and that's and that's the other thing that, that Steve was mentioning. Uh, I just sorry, just just quickly. We we moved from 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 uh, low mimetic to high mimetic, right? So 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 the the the, the original series is aspirational. It's great ideas, and, but then as you move more and more toward deep space nine, then suddenly one of the big concerns for fandom of deep space nine was it was dark. And 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 the the federation wasn't everything they thought it was, and blah blah blah, but but that's that's the world, right? So so it becomes more realistic as we move forward. Well, I and, wouldn't and go with realistic. Just I would no, say. that's just the world. We we're beginning to understand that things are not what we thought they were, and things become more and more realistic. Well, Brian, I, I think <clears throat> calling it more realistic is is where I think part of the problem comes from. The, the, the word that you use originally, I think, is much better, which is mimetic, um, a, a representation of realism of a type, as opposed to it's more realistic, because that brings in a lot of real world norms that we go, yeah, so this is what realism is, as opposed to mimesis, which uh, I, I think is a much better term for this, because it's science fiction, it's in the future, they have weird technologies, weird aliens. So talking about realism in that sense, we're, we're talking more about the, the mimesis of ideological, sociological, yes. sociopolitical yes. positions. Yes. Well, I, I would describe it more as um, disillusionment. 
is actually what yes. slips into and becomes the psychology, the driving psychology of um, a lot of the, the later iterations of Star Trek. Um, and, and, and that's, that's what I grieve the most is, is um, I recognize that, that that is a reflection of the disillusionment um, that was actually part of the outside world, you know, surrounding the, the creation of these series. And so it was, in that sense, an accurate reflection of, of uh, the ethos of the time. But um, <clears throat> that struck, struck me as being almost counterpoint, you know, almost the wrong, the wrong thing to actually be indulging in. And that we actually, you know, if one wanted to pull out from the original series, sort of a, a central premise, um, that it would have been better to go in the direction of, of wonder and exploration as opposed to disillusionment, um, to actually oh. speak against uh, reality uh, surrounding the series rather than being an accurate reflection of it. Because I think once it becomes an accurate reflection, um, accurate in you know, whatever sense, um, has Brian frozen up? I think he has. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, Wow, I'm, you held sorry, that. I was just, I was just that was amazing. thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I saw a lot of what the original series did was <clears throat> it presented itself in opposition to everything around it. Yeah. Um, here, you know, this is where individuals can get together and actually hammer out solutions without necessarily you know, creating a galactic war. Um, and then with the disillusionment that follows the 60s, we get basically the, the inevitable war or the eternal war um, that, is, that is always present there. I mean, I think the Borg really personified that when they showed up. Um, <clears throat> so Steve, so- Go ahead. So, so, the, so the original series, yes, they, they're, they're trying desperately well, Roddenberry mm. is, is imagining something better. That that was his whole goal, and yet the series does deal with, you know, real issues of the time. And then, so so just just for purposes of discussion, so you've got original series, say Deep Space Nine. Um, one is is trying to espouse the, the the greater nature but still sometimes fails and this one is trying to to describe the darker nature but sometimes aspires how do you how would you compare those those two in their i'm not taking a side here i'm just curious how would you compare those two uh um first of all i'm not a huge fan of deep, deep space nine um okay primarily for um, the way it concluded um, as, as a series, because that struck me as, uh, I guess, almost ethically bankrupt by the time they got to the end of it. Um, okay. That the decision that, that Cisco made is one that one can, you know, and, and he, he certainly struggles to rationalize it. Um, and it's basically the the uh, the ends justify the means is is the you know the final conclusion of the whole thing, um, and so th through the use of deception, um, you know the bad guys are are uh, vanquished. Um, now I have not done any sort of sort of deep analysis on the conclusion of uh, Deep Space Nine because I did not watch the entire entirety of the series so i'm not i'm not fully qualified i, I suspect you are far more qualified with deep space nine than, you know, no, I'm, I'm, just, but I'm just curious i just found it <clears throat> um it, i mean it does raise this 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 moral dilemma <clears throat> and i don't know how to the extent to which it actually ever resolved it but it may not have to resolve it, it may be up to us to resolve it uh, in our own minds whether whether this was a, a justified decision or not. Um, but I also saw that Deep Space Nine was sort of the logical conclusion of where this 
Star Trek uh, franchise was going. And uh, I think in that sense, it, it does make sense um, that this is where, and in many ways, uh, Enterprise is, is a kind of an epilogue to all of that. Um, again, quite uh, a logical continuation of the, the breakdown of, um, I think, the Federation's original premise of, of uh, its creation. Uh, I think it was completely broken by the time we get to the end of Deep Space Nine. I mean, we you can argue that. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I just felt that way. Well, what we, I point we, we see a lot of brokenness in the in the in the episodes of the the first, you know, the 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 three seasons of of the original series. Um, but it, I mean, point I to Babel does not exactly bode well for the future of no relations between different races uh and that's just one of the the 80 episodes. um they say 79 i say 80 but but uh but i how, how, so so you have a a series that's intent is to not aggrandize isn't the word uh to to champion the possibility that human beings can be better than their than their darker natures and and that we can well like right now the the the, the horrors that are happening in in ukraine it's it's just it's unimaginable at the same time we have the James Webb telescope out there getting ready to show us the origins of the freaking universe. And, and so, so here's, here's what we're capable of. And here's what we're capable of, you know, these, these two things and, 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 and Star Trek has always been dealing with both those ends of the but, spectrum. Uh but I, I think that there's a slight difference because if you think uh, Star Trek Next Generation introduces the Borg, the fear of technology as this external force that's going to corrupt us and take over us and destroy us. And it's externalized the way that a lot of science fiction and fantasy externalizes a metaphor in order to visualize it. And so we see the Borg, but so much of Next Generation then focused on the Borg as this enemy to be destroyed, not an enemy to be understood and then reconciled with it was no we must destroy the board when we move into deep space nine they don't focus on technology as the enemy it's religious zealotry and also then the idea of a covert uh hidden conspiracy of these changelings who can infiltrate and destroy our own governments you can't trust anyone the level of paranoia of that in combination with religious zealots because spirituality is to be feared and at least and where did all that and where did all that come from and you know that is obviously uh, mm. uh, Im imported very heavily from from certain things that happened in in real life but yeah. at least with cisco's journey it wasn't a rejection of spirituality um the, the, there was an attempt to show that religious zealotry on the one hand was bad, but a deep spirituality and th there was a, a faith that could be had. But again, it was externalizing a threat that must be beaten. And it was all focused on the conflict and we must destroy, we must wipe them out. When we get to Voyager and Voyager, which you would think would be custom designed as a mm -hmm. scenario for explorers, we've arrived in an area of the galaxy that no one from our species has ever explored. And yet it is a running battle. It is a constant fight for survival because they're in the unknown. Instead of they are, and we had those episodes where Janeway goes, you know, we are explorers and we're gonna look at this thing. And they always felt out of place because the previous episode and the following episode were them fighting for their lives. But, but there, there, it was, there's, also, there's also an issue in the, in the original, in, original series it's a constant undercutting of, of faith and religion mm -hmm. episode after episode after episode it's 
faith is bad, religion is bad, belief in a God, a, a power higher than us is bad. We, we've got to, it's, it's all humanism, humanism, humanism all the time, which is fine to a certain degree. Mm. But what I find interesting about Deep Space Nine is it actually, it's not just religious zealotry is bad, but also there's religious honesty. And, and there are those people who actually believe, who are real believers, true believers, and that's good. And, and, I, and I find that fascinating. It's one of the few things, uh, well, one of the many things actually of that show that I find extraordinary. The same thing at exactly the same time, you know, Babylon 5 is doing a similar story. They're both retelling Lord of the Rings, both of them exactly retelling Lord of the Rings in space. And I know that's how they pitched them so so they're, they're but they're but they're both dealing with faith and talking about faith as a as a real issue as something that's that that could be good for humans or human-like species across the board it, the, the, these 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 could be terribly important things um i i i just I, I don't know that that Roddenberry ever considered faith as a real answer. No, no, he, no, he, I agree with you. He, he yeah. always came back to the human. Yeah, yeah. sorry, Steve. No, no, I'm, I agree with you. Um, that's one of the areas where certainly the, the original series really falls down. Um, and it was one of the aspects that did interest me with Deep Space Nine. Um, but it's curious that it's, oh, no, I'm, 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 I'm at risk of drawing in discovery here. Um, I'll hold off on that. Huh. We could, no, we it, could it, talk it also, about it, Brian hasn't seen it. <laughs> Go for uh, it. Well, it Go also approaches, I suppose it's, it, it's approaching spirituality, but in a very peculiar way in the fact that it's elevating the primary, well, your protagonist uh, into that into that spiritual role. Um, so, you know, in that context, Brian, you might find it very interesting to, to watch from an academic point of view. Um, I wouldn't watch it for um, storytelling or narrative uh, aspects because it's atrocious. Um, <laughs> okay. But that no, I mean, yeah, you've just sort of opened opened a door, at least in my mind, on on thinking, in, uh, looking at the series from from a different perspective, um, from that notion of uh, uh, the spiritual. Um, and I actually, I think that's that's a, like a an interesting point to bring in because we saw obviously in the original series the Vulcans, uh, this this idea of a race absolutely devoted to the intellect, intelligent, studious academic to an absolute almost fault but they were respected they were listened to and then we look at how the vulcans have changed over the the course of all of these different um series of star trek to now bringing in uh, the spiritual element of it but also when we look at the vulcans they're usually cast as aloof arrogant you can't trust them they're always trying to manipulate you because they're smug and superior you know, what does that say about the reflection of the trust in experts and scientists, this idea of the intellect? It's don't trust them. Um, and th it, it's a really weird transition about uh, not necessarily faith in experts, but trusting that expertise and specialism and intelligence and education, these are good things. They help improve us personally. They yeah. improve our world. And yet over the course of it, we see, oh yeah, engineers are good and engineers can just do magical things but never trust an actual scientist because mm -hmm. so many scientists in the star trek universe are making incredibly dangerous weapons uh, orchestrating horrible experiments on people um, yeah. and usually being evil annoying arrogant uh people who you would never want to be around and it's the <laughs> honest to god down to earth salt of the salt of the earth characters who they have a gut feeling about something. Yeah, let's go with our gut feeling on how to solve an international crisis. 
two full episodes of the original series are dedicated to the asylum, the, 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 the inmates taking over the asylum, right? Dagger of the Mind and uh, what's the other one? The uh, um, Well, just make your point. The, the name of it is- Anyway, the, the two, two, two full episodes. Insane asylums taken over by the denizens of the asylum. In both cases, it's it's the doctors have gotten they've run amok, and and they've decided you know we're we're just gonna let them take over. It, it's just it's crazy. So so there's this whole sense that the possibility that science. Is a, is is a, is a bad thing. Um, well, yeah, and, and that's and that's that's constant throughout the original series. But with the with the with the Vulcans, it's we're 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 aloof. We're beyond that, and that's pretty much that's kept pretty steady throughout the series until you get to 79, 80, when when the motion picture comes out. And then suddenly the Vulcan belief system becomes religious mm. in, mm. In, a, in a, an extraordinary leap from, from where it was prior. Sorry, Steve. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just listening now. Go ahead. <clears throat> no, I was just, I was just, but I'm just like, talking. Oh, but Thinking about the Vulcans, if we think of um, like how they're represented in Enterprise, like the Vulcans are almost the antagonists to the humans until the Suliban arrive, and yeah, oh, okay, so we're all part of a time war. And, and again, it's a, a, an entire war narrative. But the Vulcans are seen always as trying to hold humanity back mm. and to limit humanity, and they won't let us do things. And we see the, the Vulcans time and time again are... Um, not positive in discovery especially the vulcans are dismissive of everything to do with what the humans and the discovery crew have found but what we saw in the original series quite often was okay so spock was about the elevated this is the logical thing and then on kirk's other shoulder was mccoy with the emotion going no but the right thing to do is and there was an argument between the two and kirk mediated it it was, yes, yes. It was about the, the, but the Vulcans weren't, they weren't working against us until later iterations, and, right? And that, it, that's, that's new. And I yeah. think a lot of what the original series did was it tried to articulate that it is a mediation between these sort of uh, the intellect and the heart, that you try to find a way to get the two to work together, even though they're pulling you in opposite directions. And that, that was a lot of what Kirk did. But in later things, it's, oh, uh, all of these scientists are evil, but we'll use what they research to create our thing. And, you know, we will rely on their technology, but the scientists themselves can't be trusted. And that, that's a, a sort of an anti-scientific, an anti-expert uh, message and theme that seems to develop all the way through because so many of these scientist characters and intelligent characters are crazy, insane, manipulative, amoral and evil people. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, one could very, it'd be quite interesting to see it done. Um, one could basically examine uh, modern history from, from the 60s, um, maybe even late 50s, um, all the way up to, to the present, just using Star Trek uh, as a franchise, because yeah. it really does reflect a lot of things. Um, you know, bearing in mind that both Roddenberry and... Um, Uh, Gene L. Kuhn, uh, were both uh, World War II veterans. Um, but also uh, the fact that the 60s was starting to see some um, very dubious experimentation, psychological and chemical, on soldiers um, in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, so you had that aspect of a growing distrust towards um, the, the the science, the sciences, um, 
And I do recall uh, there is certainly one Star Trek original episode where they hand over the Enterprise to a computer uh, to run uh, basically the ultimate computer. Yeah, the ultimate computer. Um, and you know, in that case, you know, it all goes wrong because uh, the computer was programmed on the basis of the mad scientist's own uh, mental state, his engram, I guess it was called. Um, so I think that that subject of, of that uneasy relationship with with technology and science was there in the original series and was explored. Um, it was never really let go of because we keep returning to it in, in subsequent series. But I mean, the Borg are not just the the fear of technology. It's also, yeah. you know, it's, it's collectivism as well, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, well, it, it's that whole political um, uh, ideological divide there that is is also being reflected. So I mean, no, you really could take that series and 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 uh, use it as a lens in which you can examine uh, our modern history. Uh, but it, be very, very well, but it's it's bizarre because the the Federation is is essentially a democratic socialist construct that it sure has, is. has eschewed capitalism and. Then you have the board coming in as collectivism and, and as a bare analog yeah. for for communism, and of course a democratic socialist uh, socialism and democratic socialism opposes communism. But well, you know we've seen the the pat sort of oh well socialism is basically communism as a, a line being pandered, and when you go well they're they're actually different. Mm -hmm. But it, it was odd then that what we see in DS Nine was. Uh, the the religious zealotry, but also the um, the the military fascism uh, as the enemy of the democratic uh, states of the federation. But I want to say, we, uh, uh, just religious zealotry, but also religious fidelity. The, 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 it's not just zealotry. The, the, they're 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 real believers that that are true. And, and their belief is legitimate. And then there are those, you know, like Kai Wen, who who are, you know, not. So so I know we we tend to focus on the zealots, but the, there's also the, the, no, the and, real believers. And again, like we're we're talking about a lot of this stuff in general. And obviously, there are, there are some episodes and some uh, storylines that are a great deal more nuanced and a great deal more complicated. And it, it is interesting to discuss, like in DS Nine. They do have that, don't they go back in, they have one of those episodes where basically they go back in time or, and, and they're fighting the Nazis. Yeah. Um, because DS9 was still anti-fascist. Like, I mean, that was a, a clear line all the way through it. Well, Whereas yeah, well. You would think, no, I would. Trek is anti-fascist. Well, <laughs> well, most. But what, and that's my point. A lot, of, a lot of what uh, Star Trek has become, you sort of go, it, it becomes might makes right. I mean, even when you look at the J.J. Abrams sort of yeah. rebooted version of Star yeah. Trek, it's, yeah. that's, that's when you get into uh, like all of these essentially military solutions to everything. It is someone yeah. to fight, find out who the enemy is, find a way to defeat them and kill them. That's it. It's might makes right all the way through. The Federation can't be trusted because they're doing nefarious things. But you know what? We're part of the Federation. We'll forgive that. And the victims of the Federation, yeah, they're the bad guys. Anyway, the the but, ideological sort of position of the a Abram stuff is so confused. Mm. I, I, I don't even know how to talk about, the, well, the third Abrams film, I just talk about throwing, it's the throwing shit at the screen film. <laughs> the, the, it, 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 in my mind, it doesn't have a title. It's just throw shit at the screen film. It, it's the whole movie is just everything is because they, anyways, all designed 3D. It was anyway. But going back to the original, sorry, I'm going to go back to the original because as much as I like J.J. Abrams in a number of ways, eh, yeah, anyway. So the original series some of what we've been talking about is just it's just a, a, a rudimentary Freudian dynamic, right? It's 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 id ego and superego. And 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 while you can you can 
break these characters down in a number of different ways. It's the, the simplest way is, of course, you know, Spock is is super ego and 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 McCoy is id because he's always angry and 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 Kirk is somewhere in between. I know a lot of people would put him in the id category, but but I think he 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 wanders between the two. So it's this this triad of three positions, you know. Do, do I lead with my mind? Do I lead with my heart? And, and, and maybe there's, there's a third position. And, and those, that, that, that triad serves as the heart of the original series. Hmm. As you move into the second iteration, next gen, it becomes more complicated and we get other, so, we, so we've got now Data, but then we've got Troy, and we've got Riker, and we've got Worf, and we've got Picard, and we've got uh, Crusher. So, so now instead of three, we've got six. And then if we throw in Jordy, we've got seven. God help us if we throw in Wesley, we've got eight, but we don't want to throw in Wesley. We want to throw him. Yep. Oh, anyway. So, 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 so seven, it gets, and, and then we get to Deep Space Nine, and now suddenly it's like 12, 13. I mean, I mean, what is, what is, uh, uh, Spoonhead, the, uh, the, the the Kardashian killer spy Kardashian uh, leader. What's his? Or the leader or the, um, the spy Ducat. killer? Gold Ducat. Okay. Um, he's he's now now suddenly he's is he one thing? Is he the other? He's both. He's you know, I don't know. <sighs> These things become really more and more. Th- part of it has to do with just the idea of telling more and more complicated stories as opposed to less complicated stories. Mm. Yeah. And, and again, like we, we pointed that out, like early, the original series of Star Trek were, were these morality plays um, dressed up in science fiction. But what we had with the later shows, it began to transition. It began to change into something else. Like even moving from the the episode of the week to the idea of season arcs and changing that structure. Because what we see with Discovery and what we see with Picard and a, a, a lot of other shows is this idea of, yeah, the, there may be an A plot that has to do with this the, the episode and a B plot that has to do with interpersonal relationships on whatever ship or the thing. And then the C plot, which was going to run all the way through, is going to be your season arc. That is going to be your your narrative drive for the entire right. season. That the C plot is always going to connect to that all the way across. And there was less of that, there was almost none of that in the original series that began Correct. to come in part way through Next Generation. But it it and it is obviously part of DS9. But it's it's only with I think Picard really that you go no it is just an entire season arc that what happens well, in every individual episode is almost incidental because it's meant to be seen as a singular narrative. In the in the original series, there's only there's only one connected narrative, the 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 the, the, the menagerie part one and two that's it. All the rest are singular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it, 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 you almost can't even compare it in certain ways to later iterations. Well, that's, it's, that's it's, what I mean. That, that change in structure radically yeah. alters what the show is doing, what it is telling, what it is exploring. Because once you start messing around with that structure, you're, you're fundamentally yeah. changing the dynamics of what every episode is doing and, and even how we think yeah. about the universe. In early Star Trek, um, if something happened in one episode, then next week you knew 
chances are they're not going to refer to it again because it's almost like every single episode was a bottle episode. But if that happened in a modern uh, series, uh, any science fiction show, where they ignored something that happened in a previous episode, we'd be like, but hang on a second, that previous episode, that thing happened. That, that can't be, you can't say that now. Because we construct this as the idea of a continuing narrative rather than individual episodes. Yeah, ep episode five, the enemy within, <laughs> um, the the one where you know Kirk gets split into you know it's the Jekyll and Hyde episode. They're two halves. Seriously, not as bad as the last episode of the entire series, which is Turnabout Intruder, which we won't. I don't want to talk about because it just makes me sad, want to cry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but but the but the but the enemy within that's that's the very first episode where Spock um when they were filming the script said you hit Kirk over the head with a phaser to knock him out and Nimoy said that doesn't have my character and he, and he came up with the idea of a, a nerve pinch but you see for the first time suddenly bam he invented this came out of nowhere he just said let's and so they and they 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 convinced the execs to do it it worked and they did it and and then that became a part of the mythology but that's the way they were telling stories it wasn't that they had a grand narrative arcs in mind backstory they didn't have the silmarillion backing them up they just oh shit we'll just do this but but even when well, you well, hold on hold on what i mean yeah i, I you know i've read the, the sort of the all the descriptions of the episodes and all that kind of stuff for the original series i'm sure you have too i said three volume set um the thing is though they were world building on the fly yeah yeah and that's one of the things that uh, really needs to be sort of taken into consideration so once that nerve pinch kicked in it was used yeah. We saw yes. it again. So it wasn't a, a one off thing that was for that one episode. And of course, the other issue is they were filming episodes in a particular sequence that did not necessarily reflect how it was released uh, for oh, television. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> they had, you know, in that sense, it would be the equivalent of doing a season of Discovery, and your first episode is episode five. Right, it, it just wouldn't work because you've got this long-term narrative stuff. But they were under other constraints, mm -hmm. and they were doing the bottle episode kind of approach, the ep uh, episodic approach. Um, but which, because which, they, which, by they the way, is exactly what happened. They 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 released the yeah. man trap as is episode one, which was episode five film. Yeah, yeah. I have a question on that. I keep going back to look at the the actual. Um, shooting dates for the various episodes because i wanted what i wanted to do was watch it from the very first episode the first shot episode um not including the cage obviously but oh, well yeah just in order to get a sense of how the actors were falling into their roles um so what i mean which i think the first episode is um is it the one where they are they're dealing with the the Romulans for the first time. Is that the first shot, first shot episode? Well, technically, it depends on how you define. Exactly. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, the band trap is is the one that ends up first, and Charlie X, yeah. strangely, is episode two, and where no man has gone before, which is the second pilot, ends up being episode three that, it, again man. this is american release not not british but american release so so uh where no man has gone before is 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 but that's really the the first episode of the cast that we know yeah. that we understand uh as as the crew of the enterprise and the enterprise and, and everything and so that that ends up being episode three. So so Brian, where no man has gone before is the one with the the blinking obstacle. 
No, this, this is the one where they they try to they try to get out of the galaxy, and and then uh, Gary and his his lover oh, yeah. okay, okay. get no. powers, yeah, and of, and they they become gods. Yeah, I remember. And, and tried to take over everything. By the way, yeah. the whole uh, galactic barrier thing is now a big thing in Star Trek Discovery. I know. It, it's yeah, an well, interesting well, interpretation. Yeah, but Star Trek Discovery has been um, retooling a lot of the original previous episodes anyways uh, for their stories. Just to tie off very, very badly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and not even disguising it, that you go, no. hang on a sec, I think I've seen this episode before. Oh, wait, I have. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a different thing. Let's not... <laughs> You're not making me want to watch the new show at all did did you not listen to when i said surprisingly the last two episodes i've seen were good and not any of the previous one although I, I think to be fair there's been about three or four episodes in the entirety of discovery that i've liked well i mean there may be precedent here um the, the notion that the series finds its feet in in, in season four the um, back half of season four yeah <laughs> yeah i mean Honestly, next generation floundered a fair bit yeah um voyager um, floundered but it floundered because all of the great aspects of conflict which they put in place with the uh, maquis being stuck on the ship they just unplugged almost instantly yeah so Steve, if you if you're asking about what i'm not i think what you're asking is what defines a, a real first episode from our perspective you know as kind of a informed perspective of what really is a first is that is that what you're uh, no it's it's when did which of the episodes did they first show up for knowing that they were doing this the full season um and start shooting well, because the dates are weird. Um, yeah, because well, then you gotta go. Playing. Well, all right, then then I've got it. Uh, all right, hold on. I've I, I I pulled it up on my phone, and if we go down to the actual uh, production order, um, it's the Corbomite maneuver. That's what I thought. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and with uh, Ron Howard's brother, it's a fantastic episode. I mean, it's just yeah. it's one so, of the yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. it's one of those weird things in that um, like you were talking about Nimoy coming up on the fly with the Vulcan nerve pinch, and yet you you would get discussions now if they tried to do something like that, it'd be like, well, why not just use your phaser set to stun? Like why even try to hit him on the head with the phaser? You phaser set to stun, shoot. But it's no, we're we're going to do this thing. But that entered into uh, Star Trek canon, and this even this idea of the construction of canon. How is what is the lore of the Star Trek universe? Is it just the TV episodes? Well, do we include the animated series? Do we include the spin-off shows? Do we include the comic books? Do we include the franchise novels? How much? What is the definitive Star Trek canon? And then, well, and, 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 and how there's, important there's, is it? Technically, the 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 cartoon. What I I consider season four. So do I. And and it and it's actually some of those episodes are better written than many of the the what we consider the first three seasons. Um, it's it's. Steve, don't you think? I mean, they're yeah. really good. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But, it, you know, we have this, and I think it's very much a modern conception of the lore, the, the canon, the, the construction of these are the rules of the universe. And, it, you know, it's, it's something that um, is always at the back of our heads when we are viewing something that is part of a bigger narrative tapestry. Because things like Discovery, Discovery moving to a future setting, uh, being blasted into the far future 
it freed them from a lot of the concerns of trying to keep to the lore because you go, it's a brand new setting. It's so far ahead that no, what was established before is no longer relevant. So they could essentially were giving themselves a tabula rasa, a blank slate to not be tied to previous incarnations and perceptions of Star Trek. Unfortunately. Well, yeah. Yeah. But there's a legal reason for that, right? But they, they couldn't do it for, for copyright considerations. Um, they could only they could only match uh, the original series. I think what was it sixty percent, something like that. Um, so they needed to. They they were sort of stuck by those constraints. So those are you know external constraints on on them. Yeah, uh, and they also think they, yeah, and unfortunately, you know what they what they used to sort of make those changes uh, had fundamental changes on the nature of the Star Trek universe and in any universe for that matter. Um, and also like they drew very heavily on the notes that Roddenberry had for uh, Andromeda, yeah. which actually yeah. also was made into a TV show with Kevin Sorbo. Yeah. I mean, Andromeda and a lot of the stuff that was going on there, but oh, look, the ship is in the far future and they're, he's going to rebuild. And you could see all of, uh, all of this was essentially a Star Trek story where the Andromeda ends up in the far future and it has to rebuild the Federation. And yeah. lo and behold, that's what we've gotten with, with Discovery. Because again, they're just recycling old stuff. The, the same thing is true for Genesis 2. You know, it, it, that whole series was... Um, not only did it include some of the same actors that showed up in, in Star Trek, but it, it's, it's, it's the same sentiment. It's the same... Because... Uh, you know, fuck, it's the same writer. He's got the same concerns. He's, he's, he, you know, we, we, we are, who we are, and we write about what we care about. And, you know, yeah, that's what happens. Um, by the way, the, the other, so sorry, it finally came back to me. So, so it's Dagger of the Mind and uh, Whom God's, right. those are the two um, inmates have taken over the asylum. And, and the only reason I'm bringing this back up is that it seems to me one could argue that the whole Star Trek universe is, is based on that Poe idea, you know, Dr. Tar and Professor Feather, that, that the inmates have taken over the asylum and, and that we have to fix it. We, we, we've, we, we've got to, to, to fix what's going on, that, that, that people suck, but you see, our dreams are important. But I would argue that the later iterations of Star Trek are not about fixing the problems. They're about blowing them out of the sky and eradicating them and going, our view is right. And that's yeah. not about fixing things. That's just about, you know, stamping your foot your boot heel on the face of someone who doesn't agree with you. Sure, sure. But I'm, I'm thinking about things up through may, maybe Enterprise, but at least Deep Space Nine. We, we can fix it. I, I don't know about past that. Well, next, see, I thought one of the things that I thought was actually interesting about Star Trek Next Generation was, you know, we, we went from a model of what a captain was in Kirk, who was very much the um, uh, Horatio Hornblower in space. And the, we moved to Patrick Stewart, who was, Picard is the diplomat. He's the gentleman explorer who's cerebral and intelligent and fascinated by what the, the yes. universe has to offer. Um, then we get Cisco who is a strong commander who's been put in command of the space station. We get Janeway, again, who's meant to be this brilliant, bright commander. But because of the movement towards war, they become warriors. Picard never came across as a warrior. No. Whereas we see Cisco and Janeway in those military roles. Yes. Picard never really came across... Like, it was more Some, uh, sometimes not always but 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 enough 
Yeah. And then when we, we look at the, the more recent, um, when we, we look at Jonathan Archer in Enterprise, the prequel that was created, I, again, it's, he, he seemed to vacillate, they, the writers seemed to create him to vacillate between. You're meant to be out there as an explorer and it's, well, no, basically everyone's in the military and we're just going to go out and kill things. That it, it was so uneasy that there wasn't a clear identity for what they wanted to do. And in order to excite the audience and entertain the audience, it always seemed to degenerate into armed conflict. That was, that was the go-to every single time for dramatic tension. And yet any writer knows like, dramatic tension can be created through all sorts of things. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the genres best at creating dramatic tension is romance. Romance functions on dramatic tension, and it's very rarely because it's two sides are at war trying to kill each other. But that's what we see the fallback is so often in a lot of modern SF. And it's the, it's the easy, oh, well, they're just a, a thing and we'll just go and kill them. And when it's, it's, episodes degener uh, degenerate to that position, and Voyager with uh, the, the Kazon, and then with, what was it, Species, whatever it was, of just these constant fights, as if that's all there was to the universe. And then when we get Discovery, it starts with the Klingon War, then it's the next conflict, and then the next conflict, and now it's another conflict. It's always an external aggressor. It's 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 one of the 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 huge well, one could argue it's a big drawback for television as a whole, and whether it's episodic or serialized television, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Romance, they don't seem to get it. <laughs> that romance can be intense, it can be middling, it can be, you know, stuttering out on the last final embers of the fire and it is just kind of just stuttering there for, uh, you know, years. Or, or, or it can re-erupt and, and, and rekindle and it can... And, and, and Star Trek in particular, to me, because it's, you know, what I care about above basically all things, um, they, they, they don't get romance. And they're, they're, they're just a couple of storylines here, there, but by and large, Name a major romance in Star Trek that has lasted, that that we can talk about as the great Star Trek romance. Data and his cat spot. <laughs> that does not help <laughs> at all. <laughs> and God, I God help me, that's probably true. It, uh, Steve, any romances um, that you can think of? Well, I mean, they're trying, obviously, in Discovery. Um, they they have a, a married couple. Um, Actually, yeah, they, they 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 killed off one of them, but then brought him back because you know killing him was a mistake, anyways, because he's actually a better actor than you know most of the people on the set. So. Um, and then they have uh, Michael and, and Book, I guess his name is. But I, uh, I, it's not a romance, though. I, I, I don't, I, at least I can't. If, uh, well, is it a romance? Col but Colbert and Stamets are a brilliant yeah. couple. Like, they, they are yeah. a fantastic couple. The highs and lows of being yeah. a couple serving on a, on a starship. So okay. it, it's a wonderful exploration of a married couple serving together. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that's in Discovery? Yeah. And that's in Discovery. Uh, and it, they, they actually, a lot of the time, okay. their scenes and what they do is quite often the highlight of an episode. Because okay, so ju just, just humor me here. Prior to Discovery? Well, there was always the question of Picard and 
and Crusher, Beverly Crusher. Um, right, but it, it goes nowhere. Yeah. Um, and then if we look at Picard, then we've seen that um, Troy and, and Riker have ended up together. Um, but you also yeah, you're... and and Picard, there was the 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 um, seven of nine and... archaeologist who oh. was running around the galaxy, and so Bash? so yeah. yeah. And and next generation, but, you had Bash, like who then two ended episodes. Up... Yeah, as a... um, and 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 with uh, the engineer. Jordan? And his wife. Oh, O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah, O'Brien and 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 and, and Miko. Miko. And, and 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 we get little bits of that here and there, but but it's always antagonistic. I I just Star Trek is not so much about romance or love. <laughs> I, I it 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 claims to be. Oh. But I, I think that's its well, one biggest. Uh, um, well, no show, no wow. show can encompass all things. I, I mean, and we appreciate that. No show can do everything all the time. Oh, sure, uh, sure. But well, hold on, hold on. I'm thinking back to the original series. You had one instance with well, Scotty. There's that one episode. There's one with McCoy, and there's certainly at least two with with. Kirk when he's on the 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 planet uh, living as a North American Indian. Um, yeah, but he 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 impregnates her and she dies. Yeah, but yeah. who was um, I? I've temporarily forgotten the character's name. The the woman who uh, used to serve Captain Picard or uh, Captain Kirk like would come in with his his food or something. And um, uh, Gilman Rand. Yeoman Rand and her unrequited love for Kirk, which was you know in a lot of the episodes where Kirk would never countenance it because he was the captain and his first love was the stars, and also yeah. she was a and, and, yeah, and he had Nurse Chapel. Is it Chapel's unrequited love for Spock? Yeah, but but yeah, but the closest the closest we get to an actual relationship with with Kirk and Yeoman Rand is when he is his alternate evil self and yeah. and tries to rape her and yeah. and the closest we get with um um is is a similar kind of thing it, it's it's just i star trek just really doesn't have a sense of continuing a love story over episode after episode and, and granted they they don't have a really sen a good sense of in at least as it started off, you know, continuing a story episode after episode, but but love stories just really are are problematic. Mm. Of course, one could say the same thing for God help us all, Star Wars. You know, it, it's just. But we're not going to go there because then we're then we're done for the rest of the day. But, you know what? I'm <laughs> And, and in fact, th th this has been, for me, this has been really interesting because there are a lot of different things to talk about with all of these iterations of Star Trek and how they are focusing on different things and uh, almost being um, an attempt to deal with, because they all deal with the concerns of the time in which they are made. They are all articulations of the contemporary problems or concerns of society and you know that's science fiction has always drawn on that i mean that fantasy quite often is heavily involved in the now it, of when it is written like the contemporary focus how that is framing fantasy it's not always backward looking the way that some people seem to think it is because of setting but the articulations of Star Trek have changed over time, just as society has and how the different concerns are reflected differently. But the, the thing that I keep coming back to that I find so strange is the movement away from exploration and the movement towards it as military. And that, I think the, one of the reasons why I liked the latest episodes of Discovery so much 
is it was addressing that concern about trying to find a peaceful solution to something or a military solution to something. And it was viewed as an overt tension, an overt choice between the two, instead of just assuming, yeah, let's just blow it out of the sky. And that return to actually considering these other things is part of why I like those latest two episodes. But why, why, don't, we, why don't we call it a night here, gentlemen? Because this has been fun. <laughs> um, I, and I was so, going to let y'all talk about discovery for a while. <laughs> well, we could do that off, off camera, so to speak. But uh, Brian, and, uh, Brian, thank you so much for, for joining me on this. I, I really appreciated your insights. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Steve, as ever, thank you so much. Because we, we talk about this quite a lot. And so it's nice for our usual conversation to be challenged by someone with a, a different point of view. So thanks for, for agreeing to this. Yeah, but it's, it's Dr. Erickson, Erickson to you. So. <laughs> I will try to find you an online doctorate, okay? Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> so thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And we will see you in the next one, maybe accompanied by Dr. Erickson. <laughs>